And so when I look out over this audience, it makes me glad to be here. And therefore, I'm expecting some really good questions when it comes to that time of the evening. But before that, I want to ask you a question. Why was it that a young 22-year-old Christian who believed the word of the Bible, who had just graduated from Christ College in Cambridge, turned out to be the fellow who changed scientific thought forever? Well, it's a good thing you're here because I'm going to answer that question. Right. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. <laughs> there was a lot of silence there for a minute, and I'm going to volunteer. Uh, okay. First of all, uh, Charles was born to a very wealthy family. Um, he uh, was born in 1809 and uh, had a really great child, but he was kind of a loner. And he got in with his cousin and he liked to collect beetles. And he liked to spend a lot of time outside. And uh, he actually got most of uh, his reading and that kind of stuff in his early age from his sisters. He didn't start uh, school until he was 13. Uh, he went to Shrewsbury to school, which was close enough to his home that he could go back and forth. Um, but he was sort of a, a loner kid. Uh, his cousin influenced him a lot because of the Beatles. And maybe some of you have probably heard this. Uh, uh, people have said, God must have really liked Beatles because they made so many of them. <laughs> he made 300,000 species. Uh, so Charles was going to collect every one of them. <laughs> and he started out that way. Anyway, he. Uh, after he had uh, gone to uh, Shrewsbury for a while, his dad began to wonder about him because he didn't spend much time with his studies, of the, the languages and that kind of stuff. He spent most of his time um, collecting beetles, uh, riding horses, uh, hunting birds. He loved to hunt birds. He was a great shot. And when he got to be 16, his dad said, hey, this has got to stop. He's just going to grow up to be a, a rich kid who's never done anything. So he said to Darwin, um, I'm a doctor, I want you to be a doctor. I'm going to send you to Edinburgh to, to college and you can be a doctor. And Darwin said, yeah, okay. And he went off to college at Edinburgh. Part of his med medical training is he had to observe operations. Uh, the first operation he observed was a 12-year-old kid who was having his leg cut off or something. And there was no chloroform in those days, and they just stuffed a gag in your mouth and let you scream and just cut away. Darwin couldn't take it. He'd be left and never returned. And therefore, he didn't do an awful lot of study. He just collect, kept collecting beetles. Um, by the way, I, I'm not off the subject. You, you just might think it, but I'm not. <laughs> Years later, um, chloroform was, uh, was discovered. And when Darwin's wife was having her eighth child, um, she was suffering in childbirth. And he said, you know, I think people have been using that chloroform stuff, not just to kill animals like he did, but started to use it on people. So he ran out of his lab, came back up, gave his wife some chloroform. When she woke up, the baby was born, and she said, Charles, this is the best thing you've ever done for me. And he said, that was one of the greatest inventions ever. Well, back to this um, So, uh, he didn't do well. He was there two years, and when he went home, he told his sisters all what was going on. Well, of course, you can't trust your sisters. They told the father, his father. And his father said, look, okay, you're not going to be a doctor. You ought to be something that's respectable. How about a minister? Charles said, fine, I'll, I'll be a minister. He said, if you're a minister, you can still go out and collect needles and, and go bird hunting and all that kind of stuff. And you just have to talk to people on Sunday. And Tom said, sounds good to me. So he went off to Cambridge to, to Christ College. He still wasn't a guy that associated with other people very much. Um, but because it, being wealthy really helped him. On today's standards, uh, he spent around $250,000 a year to go to school. Uh, he spent, he spent $30,000 on a cabinet to keep his beetles in. Uh, he had, his, his rooms were not what you would consider the college dormitory kind of rooms. They were big, spacious rooms. And he had servants. He had servants. Um, 
And he didn't do very well in his classes there either, but he did well enough to get through. And while he was there, he had a mentor, uh, a guy named Hensley, who was uh, a very religious uh, professor there, but he was interested in, in Beatles too, and got Charles to go on a number of uh, outings where they met some geologists. And, and Charles would be very interested in geology, and he took a lot of trips uh, to Scotland and Ireland and around England studying geology. Well, just about the time he was to graduate, Henslow gets a letter saying that there's going to be a trip around the world uh, to do uh, a survey trip, uh, mostly to find out the true longitude of, of many of the cities of South America. And they had invited Henslow to go, and, uh, and he couldn't go because of his age and his family. So he came to Charles and said, you know, how would you like to go around the world for a couple of years? And Charles said, man, would I like to do that? And they said, you're going to spend a lot of time in South America. Well, one of the reasons he really wanted to go to South America was because when he was at Edinburgh, he met a black guy there who had been a slave. Uh, he brought him over from Africa to South America. And while he was in South America, he uh, doing collecting for the, for the Englishman who bought him, and he learned tax and the he was very good at it. Uh, so this Englishman said, you know, you're really good at this. I think I'm going to take you back to England. So he bought him, and brought him back to England and freed him, because, you know, the English didn't have slavery, freed him, and he got a job at Edinburgh. So Darwin was interested a lot more in tax and the than he was, you know, the other stuff he was learning when he was at Edinburgh. So, uh, he went to take these taxidermy classes, and he was so interested in that that he decided to, to hire his, uh, this, this young black guy, his name was John Edmonds. Tom. Anyway, uh, he spent quite a bit of time with him, and at, the, at that time, this mentor of his could then tell him about what it was like to be a slave in Africa. And believe me, it was even worse than it was in the United States. So he had already introduced Darwin to the slavery aspect in Africa, in South America, uh, after he left Africa and went to South America. He introduced him to what slavery was like. He introduced him to taxidermy, and he talked about how wonderful the plants and animals were in South America. And Darwin, when he got the idea of a chance to go, he said, yes, I want to go. But his dad said, no. And said, you know, those ships are there. They sink a lot of times. They're just frigates, you know. They're, you know, it's too dangerous. I don't want you to go. And Darwin was brokenhearted um, until his father made a mistake and said, if you can find one man um, that's intelligent, <laughs> uh, that thinks you want to go on this on the world for two years, I'll let you go. Uh, Darwin asked his uncle. It just happened his uh, uncle Josh was Josiah Wedgwood of uh, the Wedgwood family, you know, they were, they were, they were wealthy too, uh, and wanted to go. But he couldn't go with it. But he gave uh, Darwin's father the word and said, You should let him go. So Darwin went down uh, to see the ship. He was a little worried about the ship. It wasn't very big. Uh, and, then, and the cabin he was going to be in uh, was only six feet tall. And he was six feet tall. And you know, sometimes it's kind of harder to talking about somebody famous and it kind of, you know, what did they look like? Did you just see pictures in the face? Well, Darwin was six feet tall and really broad shoulders and lots of muscles. And he was a very athletic because of his horsemanship and that kind of stuff. So when Fitzroy saw him, he thought, this is a pretty good guy to have on the ship because everybody has to work even. But Fitzroy was after uh, two things. He wanted a gentleman to be with him on the ship who could carry on intelligent conversation, mostly about the Bible, uh, and, and have meals with him. The other thing he wanted was something that had some background in science, so that the two of them working together could prove that the things that the Bible said were true by using science. And Darwin was a perfect guy. The only thing that was bad was that Darwin didn't have the right shaped nose, and Fitzroy was a phrenologist. He thought he could tell people's personality from their face and shape of their nose. Uh, 
But anyway, Darwin was such a nice guy, and he convinced him, and so, so he got to go. So they spent a week beforehand. There must have been a lot of fun. Think about this. Fitzroy's 26 years old. Darwin's 22, but Darwin's quoted. So they go shopping, because Fitzroy wants to have nice meals and nice, you know, so they buy expensive dishes and expensive cups and all kinds of great eating equipment and, and books for their library. They were going to even bought matching pistols. Uh, so they were going to hit it, hit it off. So they get on that boat, and the, the, the ship left port. It had only went um, about two days, and the storms were so bad they had to return. When they returned, Fitzroy was sure Darwin would not get back on the ship because he was terribly seasick the whole time. And when Fitzroy thought he's not going to, he's not going to be able to do it. But he didn't realize that Darwin came from a family where his father said, you always do the right thing. And you sign the contract, and the right thing is you go for two years. I don't care how sick you are. So Darwin said, I'm going. Uh, the trip didn't last two years. It lasted five. And of those five years, he was on board the ship 18 months. So he was 18 months of seasickness. Anyway, when they took off, uh, it took them a while to, to get to South America, and so uh, some time had passed. Uh, and Darwin got his first letter from home. It was from his girlfriend. I mean, think about that. I mean, his girlfriend was, you know, she was in that crowd. She was wealthy, too. She, her parents lived in a castle. And just think, he was a pretty good catch. You know, his parents were wealthy, and he was going to be a minister. And she promised she'd wait for him. Uh, her name was Fanny Owen. She was really a very attractive young lady. Um, and it's kind of interesting. So you see, when he started going with her, he had just begun to have men friends because he was kind of a loner. So in his last year of college, he did a toss back a few scotch <laughs> and, and uh, played a lot of blackjack. And, and that's when he met um, Fanny. Uh, but Fanny had to sort of fit into his lifestyle, too. So he taught her how to shoot. And told her how to hunt birds, <laughs> and they would go out in the, in the out of doors for dates, and they would lie in the fields and eat wild strawberries. And it was just a romantic kind of It's great. He was, she said she'd wait for him. Well, of course, she only waited a couple of months, and uh, she was married uh, within, within a year to someone else. <laughs> so when he got that letter, he was pretty, you know, kind of geez, you know, Fanny dumped me, you know, was, was going to dump a guy. So, but. He got off the ship right about that time and went into the jungles for the first time and completely forgot about Fanny. Um, the, the, the South America to him was, wow, how could it be any better? And then an interesting thing happened. He saw in the background mountains. He'd been reading a couple of books on geology in the, by, by a person named Lyle who had said that the Earth might be more than 6,000 years old. And, and Fitzroy and Henslow were told Darwin, okay, go ahead and read that book. I don't believe what it says, because it's not true, you know. But Darwin looks up in the mountain and he sees a whole yellow span high up in the mountain. And that is what that is. And when he checks it out, he finds out it's snails and clams and leftover lobsters. It's things that lived in the ocean. And he said, gee whiz, the land must have gone up, must have raised. I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit here. Later on, Darwin happened to be really lucky that he was in South America and Chile when there was an earthquake. And he saw the land come up. He was also there when he saw, when, when there was a volcano that went off, and he saw the land come up. He said, look at The Bible says that the earth is fixed. Well, it isn't fixed. You know, I can 6,000 feet up in the air, there are all these things that lived in the ocean about us sometime. The earth isn't fixed. So when he sits down and talks to Fitzroy about this, Fitzroy said, wait a minute, Charles. The earth is fixed. And they had an argument. Well, Fitzroy gets mad at him and kicks him out. So Darwin has to leave the captain's cabin, go down and eat with the officers. But the officers like that one, you know? Uh, so he gets along with Fitzroy, eventually changes his mind, lets him come back. But that's just the first of many arguments. The next one was about slavery. Darwin couldn't believe how poorly they treated the slaves. He was just appalled at that. 
And when he talked to Fitzroy about that, Fitzroy just said, but slavery is okay. It says in the Bible, slavery is okay. And Darwin says, you know what, I don't care what it says. It's not okay to treat these people the way they're being treated. He got kicked out again. Yeah. And eventually, this word, let him come back again. Well, then the next big argument was when they were talking about plants uh, behaving and animals behaving reproductively. And uh, Fitzroy happened to mention, boy, you can get different colored animals by just taking different colored sticks and putting them in front of the sheep and, and goats. And Darwin said, get that idea. He said, well, you know, you're the minister. Don't you read Genesis? And it says, you know, let's what happened was, you know, the sticks and maybe take a bar pot, put them in front of the sheep and go, so that's what color would be. And I would say, no, that, that is wrong. That is just wrong. That can't be true. Another argument, now with the officers again. You know? So, so they got so they spent less time with each other. So Darwin, because he was rich, he would get on land, he would rent horses, rent carriages, uh, rent guides, and away they go and, uh, and, and collect. Uh, I've got to make sure that you understand that a lot of those things that Darwin did, he did because he had, he called him a servant, but he really was more than that. When they left for the boards, the boards, they always had young men aboard, uh, a lot of helpers. And one of those boys was a young kid, he was 14, his name was Sims Covington. Well, Sims Covington, you know, he's 14 and Darwin's 22 and they were pretty close in age and right away Darwin said, I'm going to go, you know, look for shells and, and birds and bring up, you know, when I go. And of course, Sims said, yeah, because when the ship was docked, what was he going to do? So he started running around with Darwin and doing a lot of collecting. Well, after a couple of years, um, Darwin went to Fitzroy and he said, look, why don't you fire Sims? You won't have to pay him anymore. You know, I'll pay him and I'll hire him as my servant. And Fitzroy was thinking, well, this is a good way to save money, and he went for it. He had to check with the Admiralty, of course, but he went for it. Now, I want you to understand that Darwin did not get paid. He had to pay for the voyage. He had to, he had to give the Admiralty uh, a lot of money just to be able to take the trip. Um, so from then on, for the rest of the voyage, Sims and Darwin were a team. And wherever Darwin went, Sims Covington went with it. And so many of the things that you hear about Darwin collecting, actually Sims Covington might have collected them. Or many of the notes that could have been the Sims Covington. Um, whenever a ship would come by, if it was heading for England, Darwin would give them the stuff he'd collected. He sent back to England, to Cambridge, 1,500 specimens preserved in Rome. Uh, or, or in barrels full of uh, He sent back 5,432 bones and rocks and skins. He sent back 3,000 pages of notes. I mean, he and Sims were busy during <laughs> that, that, that trip. And some things happened. Um, one of the things was the Rhea. Um, Darwin, Darwin knew that there were ostriches in, in Africa, and he knew that there were emus in Australia, he knew that there were penguins in the South Pole, and he knew that there were rheas in South America. And he, and he asked these questions. He said, why would God do that? It doesn't make any sense to have a bird that can't fly. What was God thinking? You know, to have a different bird on every continent who can't fly. That doesn't make any sense. Well, then, they were eating the, 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 uh, the artists on board. They all hunted, of course. The artists on board went out hunting, and he shot a rhea. And he brought it back, and they were eating it. And Darwin said to him, geez, this is a little smaller rhea. It must have been a young You don't see any of those. And the guy said, oh, no, this isn't a young This was an adult. And one of the natives there said, yeah, this is a rhea that they get from over there. They're kind of rare. They're a different kind of rhea. And Darwin said, a different rhea? That doesn't make any sense either. So he said, what did you do with the skin? So he ran back and got the skin, saw the skin, and said, son of a gun. There is more than one kind of rhea in South America. Why would God do that? 
I usually have a continent that's got two different kinds of real out of one apparently was sufficient, uh, but he, you know, that's another one. He put that in the back of his mind. Well then, another thing that happened is he began to think about the animals, the way they were distributed in South America. And he said, you know, animals are distributed around the, the planet in strange ways. Uh, and he was trying to you know, make some, some sense of that. But he was still sort of hanging on to that, you know, the Bible can't be, be wrong thing. Well, when they left South America, the next topic point, by the way, they spent you know, two, over two years there. When they left there, they went to the Galapagos. And in the Galapagos, the first thing you see is, um, are these marine iguanas. Now the marine iguana looks almost like a land iguana, except it never eats anything on the land. It only eats things it can get in the water. And again, Darwin said, why would you have two iguanas living on the same islands, and one of them, they can't breed with each other, they're different species, you know? And then he says, of course, the Bible said, uh, species are not changeable. You know? Well, then the, then, then the real killer came along because he sees the flightless cormorant. The flightless cormorant has really good wings and really good feathers, and it can't fly. And the question Darwin asked, and by the way, we know he asked these questions not necessarily from some of the, the, the books of Hill, but because uh, of the letters he exchanged with his family. A lot of those have gone on saved. Anyway, he said, how did this thing get here from Noah's Ark? You mean you got a comrade that can fly? Okay, it can get it. But the other one, he had to swim all the way here and with all the wet feathers and then they can sense it all to it. You know? Well then, when they go around the tip of South America, uh, Terra del Fuego uh, had some natives down there, the Fugians. The Fugians uh, were very, very primitive people. They didn't make huts, they didn't make tents, uh, they, they lived outside. Uh, Darwin couldn't imagine. He, he said, how can those people be humans? when they're so different from me. I mean, look at it. You know, I'm a college person. And, you know, I'm old. I've got a pistol. I've got... I mean, these people are living like that. How can they possibly be humans almost? But he said, you know, I know, I know who they are. They've got to be. They're just, you know, kind of what's going on. Um, so, uh, they were... Re actually, they were returning three few years Fitzroy picked up three Fugians uh, a few years before, brought them to England, taught them English, taught them all English culture, taught them how to eat properly, taught them all this stuff, and they were bringing them back. And that's why uh, he was there and, 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 and met the Fugians and didn't know, know what was going on. And when they left there um, and, and went to uh, the Galapagos, uh, he saw uh, uh, the same kind of things that we've been seeing with, these, with the strange animals. I know some people will say, yeah, that's where the finches came, Darwin's finches. Well, actually, the story is not quite right, you see. Darwin said, you always find something, take your notes right now. Do not pick up something else until you've got the notes on that thing. <laughs> well, in this particular case, Hewlin Sims Covington collected a bunch of finches uh, and they didn't record what islands they came from. And years later, when he was trying to figure out what was going on with the finches, he looked at his skins and he said, geez, I didn't know where these things came from. But then he remembered Fitzroy was doing collecting too. <laughs> so he wrote a letter to Fitzroy and said, did you keep track of which island you got your finches from? And Fitzroy said, yes. And he said, do you think I could borrow them? <laughs> I know that must have really bothered Darwin to do that because he wasn't getting on. But Fitzroy did. He brought his finches up. And Shared it with Darwin, and Darwin uh, wrote up all about the, the different beaks and finches and got all kinds of credit and, uh, because of Fitzroy. Well, then, when they get to uh, 
when they, when they, when they leave there uh, and they finish their voyage around the, around the world, he gets back to England. Now he's uh, he's uh, 26, 27 years old, and he's got a lot of stuff to look through. I mean, he's, you know, he's got all those notes he sent back, and he's got you know. So he starts going through all this stuff. And here's an interesting thing because many people that have studied in Darwin try to figure out when it was that he began to think species change, you know? Species change, and the earth changed. And there's no way to really pinpoint that, except he said, you know, if the Bible's wrong, and he said, and I think it is, then there's got to be something this right. So he was, 30, he was about 32 then. He'd already, he'd already gotten married and, you know, and uh, had a nice place to live in London. But he sat down and wrote a short article about the laws of life. And he said, I'm going to dedicate my life finding out the laws of life. I mean, think about that. You know, he's a young guy, actually, and he's decided to find out the laws of life. <laughs> and he did it because he said, the Bible's wrong. You know, that's it. It's just wrong. It's not wrong in geology. It's wrong in geology. It's wrong in species. It's wrong, you know, there's a thing in science and energy and kind of at all. But something has to be right. And then he started doing his research. But he had some serious problems. One was he had very poor health. And they'd never really been able to figure out what was wrong with him. Some people think he had a worm infection. Some people think he had psychosomatic. But well, whatever it was, for the next 30 years, uh, he suffered greatly, throwing up, diarrhea. In those days, they said he had flatulence. You know. uh, he tried all kinds of cures. He worked every day, even when he was sick. He worked every day. And he continued his research. He moved to a house called uh, near uh, in Kent, uh, near a little village called Down, and he named his house the Down House. And uh, his father was appalled. How can you how can you do that? This is just a shack out here. And Darwin says, Well, I'm gonna improve it a little bit. And he says, But I'm gonna, we're gonna have children, and I'm gonna add rooms as we need them, which he did. Uh, he, uh, of course, he had to have his rooms to work in. He had to build a greenhouse and all these kind of things. Uh, and he, he built another big house right next to his house for the servants. They always had 18 to 20 servants. Um, and he started, his, his, his research was done there. A lot of it was done on pigeons. But he did a lot of research worldwide by mail. During that 20 years from the time that they moved to Down House until the time he finally uh, published his uh, Origin of Species, uh, 15,000 letters were exchanged. 15,000 of them. The people in the post office from London, the ships would come in and bring in stuff because he'd be asking people things. Uh, he'd say, you know, send me some Bible study of articles for eight years. He would send them all parts of the world and say, send me some of your barnacles. I want to compare to my barnacles. So the mail would just flood it. So the post office in London said, we'll deliver mail twice a day. So he got you know, the post office from his house. It was a, was a, you know, a good three-hour ride. By horse. But they delivered mail twice a day because they had to. So if they didn't, in two days they'd have so much mail that they wouldn't have to do with it. So mail was really uh, extremely important to him. And so, that, so the research continued in, 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 that, in that fashion. Now, uh, I have to, I, I, because I want you to understand the kind of guy he is, I also want to tell you that he never, as soon as Covington, I would say we have to classify him as a friend. Because uh, Sims Covington stayed with him about four years after they got back. But then Sims was, you know, one of the more funny his whole life. And he went to Darwin and he said, you know, the place for a young guy to go to really make it is back to Australia, and that's where I'm going. So he went back to Australia, but they kept up their friendship by mail. But Darwin had a real friend, and I, I kind of 
almost hate to say that he was the butler, because that sort of gives you the idea that, ah, you know, he's working for God. But that isn't the way it was. He hired um, Joseph Parcelo uh, when they were still lived in London. And Joseph worked for them for 32 years. He held Darwin's head when he was retching up when he was sick. He played billiards with him almost every night. Um, he helped him with all of his experiments. Um, when Darwin died, uh, Parcelo was one of those people who was allowed to go to the funeral in Westminster Abbey. When Parcelo died, he was buried in the Darwin family plot. This was a, a different kind of, of, a, of a relationship. Darwin had that. Now, it didn't mean that he, he, he had a lot of friends who were also scientists. Uh, some of the interesting stories about um, Darwin and his, they had I, a marriage that was so good. I mean, they had 10 children. Uh, seven of them uh, survived to adulthood, two died in infancy, and then uh, one of the, the little girl, you know, Annie, died when she was nine. Until that time, uh, Darwin always, on the rules of the believer, he always went to church with his wife. He said, you, I'll, I'll take you to church. He took but when his daughter died, when Annie died, he said, I'll take you, but I'm not ever going inside the building again. Well, that's sort of the end of it for him. Um, so his children were, he was very different because in those days, Fathers were often, you know, I grew a house in there. Darwin wasn't that way. He spent every day, some time, playing with his children. Um, when they became, even, you know, young teenagers, they helped him with his research. Uh, the last book he wrote, which is really a good book, was about earthworms, and that was published about two or three years before he died. But when they were doing the earthworm research, the whole family would be involved. He'd have them go out and, and get different kind of plants to see what they'd eat. He'd have them um, they'd stand around the, 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 making noises to see what the earthen was, what reactions they would have to the, to the noises. So they were, the whole family was involved in being, you know, a, a family. Um, when he was talking to um, one of his friends who was a scientist one day, and he said, there we go about um, playing all the billiard games in the garden, says, I keep track of that. He says, well, I keep track of all the uh, games that uh, my wife and I play uh, a blackjack every night. He said, you really keep track of all the games you've played? He says, yeah, you know, my wife has won 2,400 and something. He says, and I've won 2,600 and something. You know, we keep track of that, you know? The guy says, wow, that's amazing. And Darwin says, well, yeah, we also keep track of our, how often we've had sex. I said, you mean you've got a calendar someplace? And John said, no, that's, that's, that's important stuff to know. Well, it may be important to know, and you can, and I, I, and you can read about that in some of his literature, but I have tried to find out <laughs> that number, and I have been unable to find out who's got that number written in some place back at the, back at the John house. Um, so, um, so, uh, now I want to, about Emma, his wife, um, she was highly educated, and she could read German. Darwin couldn't read German, but much of the scientific literature came from Germany. So all the scientific literature, he, he never read it in. She read it all to him. And for some reason, she didn't really want her daughters to be educated, but I'm not. I never really understood that. She wanted her sons to be educated, but she didn't care much about her daughter being educated. But she was very interested in making sure that the poor people in the village had an education. So she started a free school at Dumb House for the poor kids to come and, and, and learn how to, how to read and write. Uh, she was a, 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 an amazing individual. And uh, she did need to read to her, usually a, a couple hours Every evening. Um, and then uh, I, I need to um, mention just a, a, a little bit more about, about Down House. Um, Darwin hid things. 
things. <laughs> he had secret compartments all over the house. They've, just in the last, you know, I got asked seven or eight years, they found a little place to a wall that nobody knew about. You know, you know. Um, but, uh, and, and he had to hide some things because he liked chewing tobacco. And his wife did not like him chewing tobacco. So the butler would go out and buy tobacco and sneak it into him. You know? so, uh, so the townhouse had all kinds of cubby holes and that kind of things around there where, where things were, were sort, of, sort of hidden. And Darwin was funny about that. He had a big box that had keys to everything. And he didn't let, not even his wife could open that box. He, he kept track of everything that was, that was locked up. Um, and so, uh, after a while, uh, when, his, when his kids got old enough, then they began to help with some really great research. And when he was doing the woman study, years before, he had heard his father-in-law say something like, you know, that field over there used to have a lot of lime on it, and I was seeing in lime now, it's down a couple of inches. So it's all covered with sweat. Where that come from? It must be the worms brought it up. Well, Darwin got to thinking about that, and he thought, yeah, that's probably true. So he went to a field that he knew was covered with rocks 20 years before, and you couldn't see any of the rocks. He dug down and there they were. He says, somebody's bringing soil up, it's got to be the worms. So he asked his son, who by then was an engineer, how are we going to solve this problem? And his son said, well, let's make a worm stone. And what the worm stone was, a stone about, you know, this big around. And his son then put a micrometer measuring outfit in the middle of it. So they could measure how much that stone went down because the soil was brought up, up around it. It became the famous, the famous worm stone. I know some of you may have not heard about it, but remember it for now. <laughs> um, and if you go to Down House, that worm stone is, is still there. You can want to see that. And you can go upstairs and see lots of his writings and books and, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. And so his whole life was was a different kind of life than many people think about. They just think about well, Darwin and evolution. You don't think about him being a great father and a great husband and a great friend and, obviously, you know, a great scientist. Um, I think the only other thing I want to mention to you that's, that's important, and I don't, I don't want to forget anything I think is important. One of the first things he found when he was in South America were bones. And when he dug up a bone, and the skull was about two feet long, he said, well, this is a sloth. But the sloths aren't that big. This animal must have lived here a long time ago. Now they're gone. And he was lucky sometimes. He was going to a place digging, and he dug up a bone, another bone, another bone, and it wasn't long before he had dug up almost a whole gigantic sloth. They named it Megatherium. And there's only been one other Megatherium found before that, and it was found in Spain. And again, Darwin said, you know, how did that get here? You know? And so, when you're learning about Darwin, my feeling is one of the best books to read about him really is The Voyage of the Beagle. Because there's where all the evidence came up, where he began to say, there's got to be another way. There's got to be another way. And then, of course, Origin of the Species, uh, when it first came out, it sold, they put 2,500 copies. They all sold the first day. It's been reprinted 400 times in around 29 uh, languages. You know. um, so, I don't need to talk to you about evolution. <laughs> I just need to talk to you about how a 22-year-old young man finally decided there's got to be another way. And that's what we did. Um, I want to, I want to. You have plenty of time. Yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to have you ask me some questions. But before, before you, you do, uh, I'm going to put some handouts down on this table that you can all have right there. And, and one of them, the handouts, is about the Oxen debate. Because um, Huxley and a, and a scientist named Hooker uh, debated a good, good Bishop Wilberforce and the whole church community about evolution and creationism. Uh, 
uh, the year after uh, Origin of Species came out. And I've got a, a trifle on that. And, uh, and then I've got a, a, a biology test, an evolution test, that was given to high school teachers a number of years ago. Uh, and uh, I'd like to take that home and, and play around with it. I've got the, uh, the percentage of teachers that answered each one of the questions on it. And you should have some fun with that. But this isn't an evolution night. This is a, a, a Darwin night. Now, I'm ready. I wanted to quit at 7.30, and I did. <laughs> so I'm ready for questions. 